Hey y'all, hope you're doing well today. So I've been, um, <clears throat> I've been researching a lot about, um, you know, our empathy and traps with um, people who, who want to manipulate and use us and abuse us and uh, our empathy and uh, the shadow within the psyche and all those kind of things, okay? So I, I had a message um, come to the surface. It's kind of how I view it, like bubbling up. Um, kind of like my <laughs> my little uh, blue icon for the channel, you know, with the, the white um, bubbles. It's like, um, that's how I feel like truth um, comes to me sometimes. It sort of feels like, um, <clears throat> like it's surfacing, you know what I mean? So, um, anyway, I had, I had this truth um, surface from all these various um, different uh, dots, right? These, these dots that started to just come together and connect. And uh, the message, it was powerful for me. It was, <clears throat> it's one of those things where it's kind of like on one level you know it, but then to, to take a deep dive into it and, and pull together specific points and look at them in a different way, which is what we're gonna do today, right? It's all about <laughs> shifting our perspective, um, looking at everything from a different angle. Um, it, it just provides us this, this deeper level of understanding. <clears throat> it does for me. And so um, I just, I was really excited to share with you all, right? So here's the thing about people who um, we have identified as narcissistic or um, toxic in some manner, okay? Um, <clears throat> I feel like you can research about this topic um, till you're totally dumbfounded, confused, blue in the face, and the thing is, you'll never fully understand what I feel like is a corrupted heart. You just never get, because you're, in other words, <clears throat> we have this, um, this desire to empathize with, with people. And what happens when you empathize with, with another person, right? <clears throat> so you have sympathy, but empathy is like this, this deeper level. When, when you're a caring person, it, that's kind of what you, you do with someone who, um, you perceive is struggling in some manner, okay? It essentially means that you're putting yourself in their shoes. And the thing is, that's why, that right there explains why we'll never understand someone with a corrupted heart because we literally can't put ourselves in their shoes um, here. <clears throat> Our minds and hearts just don't work that way right? And the, the trap is that, <clears throat> and I'm speaking from experience, the trap is that we think that everybody's psyche works the same. Wouldn't that just be so simple <laughs> and neat and orderly to be able to just categorize all humans, um, you know, their psyches all operating the same way? And I feel like throughout time, um, psychology uh, clinicians and researchers have, have tried to do this. They've attempted to do this and, <clears throat> and even felt like they've made some headway. But there's still a lot of aspects of, of people who exploit and use others that just can't be defined, can't be explained. And this is why I think a lot of people um, find comfort and answers in taking it from the clinical um, <clears throat> into the spiritual. Because it's kind of like that's the only thing that can explain a corrupted heart, right? Um, <clears throat> it's just hard, I think, sometimes for us to really believe. Um, it, it's easy to believe a villain in a movie has a bad heart because that's fiction you know and it's like we <clears throat> we know of these stories but there's comfort in separating that from our reality you know because we think that's separate that's fiction it's not really reality and so we think that those who are in our um our close reality <laughs> like there's no way they could they could have that same kind of corrupted heart and mind like a this horrible horrendous villain in a movie but that's why it's a shock, right? It's a shock to us. 
And so we're just going to be doing a deep dive into um, some perspectives around this topic today. All right, so I hope you enjoyed today's presentation, <clears throat> and I hope you're doing well today. All right, <clears throat> so um, to explore some folklore tales, and this is pulling in some tales um, from the book that I reviewed. Um, I've got a whole series on it on my channel, Women Who Run With the Wolves. It's um, full of um, folk tales that are um, very symbolic of, uh, specifically with regards to um, your psyche and psychological growth and maturity, okay? So I'm just gonna be pulling just a few elements together to make a point, right? <clears throat> to make several points. So um, there was a story in the book called The Seal Maiden. I think it was called The Seal Maiden. I literally left my house without the book today. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I intended to bring it, but you know, that's, that's life, right? <laughs> so um, I think it was called The Seal Maiden. And <clears throat> you know, a lot of times we, and it's meant to be this way, I feel like. We relate to the main character in these stories, okay? So in the seal maiden, if you remember in the beginning, she was just happy, just doing her thing on this rock, right? And that's what, um, she was with her people, just rocking along, um, and um, they were just up, I think, singing and dancing on this rock, right? That was, you know, projecting up out of the ocean. Now, along came this fisherman. And remember, every character in these stories, at least in, in that book, um, the author explained that the characters were representative of a function within one person's psyche. All the characters were all within one person's psyche, right? Uh, they were um, metaphorical. So <clears throat> this fisherman comes along and he was lusting after her, right? He had this strong desire to take her um, as his own, as his bride, as his wife. And the fisherman, if I'm not mistaken, at least from my perspective, I can't remember how the author defined him, but I'm almost, almost positive. He was defined as the ego, okay? So that was interesting. So she's, she's doing her own thing. She's dancing happy, you know, just rocking out on, on, on the rock, um, projecting up out of the ocean. And he's, he's coming along and he's lusting after her, right? And he wants to entrap her because of his desire. So keep that in mind. Then we have the handless maiden story. And um, she was a young maiden just at home um, on her family's um, <clears throat> farmland. And she was just content, um, innocent. Um, everything was fine. And then the father, which I believe the author described as the gatekeeper of the psyche, right? He was representing that part of our psyche. But the father in the story wanted to enrich his family, right? Um, by accepting an offer um, for a trade. And so his actions were out of love for his family, right? And then you have the character of the devil in the story who wanted to entrap the maiden, just like the fisherman with um, the seal maiden. He wanted to trap the maiden. Well, here we have the devil wanting to trap um, the maiden by tricking, you know, the father, the gatekeeper, right? Tricking us, essentially. Um, <clears throat> again, wanting to entrap the maiden because of desire, lust, want, right? So, um, what's interesting is <clears throat> the characters seeking to entrap the main character, right? The devil, the fisherman, they seem or feel foreign to us, right? Um, and that's where, um, <clears throat> when all of these characters are supposed to represent a part of our psyche, that's, that's hard to grasp. And I feel like they're, they're, we're starting to get into, um, what Carl Jung calls the shadow, right? The shadow aspect of us. The part part of us that maybe we don't want to own. We want to disown that part of us and we push it away. It feels foreign to us, right? And I'm not going to go too deep into that in this video. I just wanted to point that out. <clears throat> but let's just take a look at what's driving the, the characters um, that are wanting the maidens, right? It's desire. It's desire. All right. Now, here's, here's something interesting. <clears throat> So there's another story called Vasilisa the Wise, if you remember, if you've been watching my channel. And in that story, the stepmother and the stepsisters wanted to destroy her, okay? Uh, they didn't want to entrap her. They wanted to just destroy her. And what was interesting is, so that was desire. They, they desired to destroy her. 
And then you had the main character, Vasilisa, who also had a desire. Um, and her desire was to please the stepmother and the stepsisters. <clears throat> so here we start, you know, and you can spend some time with, with even just the little bits and pieces I've shared with you thus far in this video, okay? <clears throat> so, like the father in The Handless Maiden, his desire was from love um, for his family, right, to enrich them and to, um, because the devil promised him riches, right, his family riches. And so the father had good intentions, but he was just, you know, easily fooled. He was naive, right? <clears throat> well, the same issue um, pops up here in Vasilisa because she, she's naive too, that um, her stepmother and stepsisters have bad intentions, just like the devil had bad intentions in um, The Handless Maiden. So Vasilisa's desire is to please them, right? Um, <clears throat> she's lost her mother. Her mother passed away when she was young. And so now she has a stepmother and she just desperately wants to be accepted and loved um, into this family, right? So desire is driving her too, desire to be loved. And then they have the stepmother and stepsisters have the desire to destroy. So there's desire on both sides, which is interesting, okay? Just to note um, in relation to entrapment, you know. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> so here we're starting to see in this, this recent story talking about Vasilisa, a closer representation of what we have in a narcissistic entrapment, right? One seeks to destroy and one seeks to unite or pacify or uplift or heal or enrich um, so one has bad intentions and one has good intentions, right? There's, there's a seeking on both sides. There's a desire on both sides. So you might view desire as a hook, <clears throat> right? Or see, if you're, if you're content, remember in the beginning of these stories, like um, the seal maiden and the handless maiden, the main character was content to start with, right? There was no desire there. They were just content as things were. So you may say desire is the hook, right? Um, wanting more, even if the intentions are good, like wanting to be accepted into a family or wanting to provide riches for your family, whatever it is. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, we just want to slap a label on desire is just all bad. But again, it comes down to the intentions behind it, right? And you might even start to apply the lens of the mindset of wholeness and um, completeness and um, just contentment versus the lens of lack, the mindset of lack, because <clears throat> what, would, what would drive desire, right? Want, want, need, a mindset of lacking um, would drive desire, I feel like, you know, and feel free to apply your own terminology and your own lens there, but I'm just giving you some things to think about, okay? So, <clears throat> what's interesting about all this, remember, um, someone with good intentions who's um, reading these kind of stories, these kind of books, wanting to learn and grow, um, the intention is good. The intention is to, to want to understand the human mind, the human psyche, how it operates, um, so that we can bring things up out of our um, unconsciousness to our conscious awareness so that we can grow and become the best versions of ourselves we can be. Um, so there's good intention, but here's the issue. I have learned that you cannot apply traditional psychological mechanics to some people. You just can't do it. When I talk about the corrupted heart, that's what I'm talking about here, right? So, <clears throat> you know, when we speak about terms like the darkness, um, a lot of times you'll find, even on um, other channels that talk about psychology, it's related to um, aspects of our psyche, like our unconscious, our shadow, rep repressed traumas, and things like that. So we're still leaving out this other whole um, reality of people who have a corrupted heart. That's different, right? And I think that sometimes unknowingly we're trying, we reconcile the two in our mind, you know, like, oh, they just have unrepressed traumas. Well, that leaves room for hope that a person will get better. You see what I'm saying? And that would create desire for them to get better. So that's the hook. That's the hook to keep us entrapped. And these people know that. That's why a lot of times they'll try to fake us off like they're trying to learn and grow. 
but there's nothing to show for it. That's why, you know, Bible verses like a tree is known by the fruit it bears is so important because you have to look at not what they say, but are they actually improving if they're truly going through all these efforts or if they're really reading this book, they're telling they bought, or maybe they bought a bunch of books to try and impress you that they're, they're working on themselves. But <clears throat> when you ask what it's about, they really can't tell you a whole lot or they tell you almost word for word, the summary of what you can read online. So there's, there's ways that you can uncover, you can clearly see the fruit, right? That the tree is, is bearing. So that's what you have to look at, right? <clears throat> now, healthy individuals um, do have the ability to work on, um, work on themselves, right? <clears throat> and to heal. All right. So um, the issue that entraps us is that we are assuming that all people are, are the same, that, you know, these people with corrupted hearts are like us and they're not, okay? So I want to take a look again at, at these stories. So for example, Vasilisa had no idea going into the forest to find the firewood or the coal or whatever it was, you know, to rekindle the fire in the home, because that was um, the quest, the, um, the mission that her stepmother sent her on. Right? So she thinks that she's doing good. She wants to please. There's the desire. She wants to please her stepmother. And their intentions uh, <clears throat> in sending her out into the woods specifically to this um, witch's house, right? <clears throat> Stereotypical folklore type of witch. Um, was that they thought she would, she would kill her. So their intention was to, to destroy Vasilisa, right? So, her stepmother, here's the important part right here. Here's the key. Her stepmother actually exploited Vasilisa's empathy. She knew that Vasilisa wanted to please her. So, there's an example of how her empathy was exploited. Our empathy can be exploited. Our desire to please. <clears throat> All right, now let's take a look at the handless maiden. The father was acting from love for his family. Remember, like we talked about, the devil was acting from greed. The devil exploited the father's love. So here we have an example in Vasilisa where the main character's empathy was exploited, right? Her desire to be um, loved, um, to be accepted um, by showing her love for through her actions, her stepmother and her stepsisters, you know, wanting to please them, wanting to um, provide them with the coal to rekindle the fire so they'll be warm. So we have two examples here where love and empathy are exploited. All right. <clears throat> so, um, all right, I'm going to read my notes here. It says, if these are now, remember, all of these characters in these stories are supposed to be um, aspects of oneself, right? And if that's the case, it gets complicated, okay? But let's just, let's just look into it for a minute, okay? Because right now we're, we're relating this, um, these characters to, you know, someone with good intentions um, versus someone who has bad intentions, right? So it's important, I feel like, to look at these stories in that manner too. But let's take a look at this because the author says these are all... Um, representative of aspects of one person's psyche. <clears throat> All right. So I believe it's possible that our empathy and, and or our love for others can have its own shadow. Okay. Now take a look at this. <clears throat> when we feel that we can change a situation for the better, we have good intentions, but it gets dangerous for us when we can't accept that our empathy, our love, our tolerance, our giving nature, our desire to lead um, won't change things. That's where our ego is now part of the equation. Okay, see how I don't feel like we, we normally relate our ego to to our, our wanting to love someone, but it's desire, see. You have love and empathy, but then you have the desire to love, the desire to empathize, and the desire to um, to give and to lead and to help, right? Come to someone's aid, all of those things, right? And it's from a good place. It truly is. But there's the hook of desire, of wanting to see a good outcome, right? So it gets dangerous when we can accept that our empathy and our love and all this stuff won't change things because what does it require?
for us to be unhooked and safe <laughs> and not be destroyed, right? It requires surrender. That's what I mean when I say recognizing that our love can have a shadow or an aspect that we don't want to acknowledge, right? That it can actually be what entraps us, what gets exploited and possibly brings us not just to our knees, but um, just horrible, horrible results, possibly even death, right? <clears throat> Now, here's what's really interesting. So I said it requires a surrender, right? Acknowledging that we can't change things with our love, all right? So now let's take a look at Elsa from um, the Disney movies, Frozen, right? If you remember, it's kind of like the main part of the story, I feel like, starts from um, this point of victimhood with her. Because if you remember in the beginning, you know, she had this power, right? And you have to think about what her power represents. We're going to talk about it, but she has this power right? And she doesn't know how to use it. And so <clears throat> she accidentally harms her sister, right? <clears throat> and then her parents die. She has this awful turn of events and all this stuff. Well, so she's kind of like, she's isolated in this room, so she doesn't hurt anyone. So she's kind of living in the state of victimhood, okay? And she resented her gift. She truly did. And <clears throat> it took her going into the cave to see her family's history of corruption, of sin, for her to understand that some things are out of our hands, right? So if you view her power as her love, because love is powerful, it truly is, but we have to know when to, I don't want to say use it, but when to share it versus when to preserve it, right? So, <clears throat> when we can admit that some things are out of our hands, such as those with a corrupted heart, we can't heal them because we think they just need healing, you know, because we think it's an illness and not a disorder. Um, <clears throat> when we finally admit this, it's like a paradox of relief and also powerlessness because as long as we feel like we can change a situation, here's where the ego comes into play. As long as we feel like we can change a situation with our love, you know, that's our ego. That's the desire, it's our ego, okay? So you have to come to a point of surrender, which is, um, I feel like representative of that Bible verse where it talks about um, God saying, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So it's letting go. Just like that song in Frozen, right? Let it go. It's um, coming to a place of powerlessness, but it's also a place of relief. And so that's why I love the term surrender, okay? And so I thought it was interesting. There was also a song, um, I think it was where um, Elsa's sister, Anna, had fallen in love with this, um, this man she barely knew. And I think the song, or maybe, maybe it was when she met um, uh, Christoph. I can't remember. Um, there's a song called Fixer Upper, right? <laughs> so he's a bit of a fixer upper, so she's a bit of a fixer upper. And so that's just it. <laughs> when we, we see a person is struggling um, and we want to help them, and that, that's a hook. That's a hook. Um, <clears throat> so um, our, our, our gift, right? Our power, like Elsa had this power, is our light, our empathy, our love. Okay, and when we start to truly see that as our biggest pearl, then we have that Bible verse come to light again, right? Don't cast your pearls before the swine, lest they turn and trample them. So we are instructed to keep that secured, right? And to understand that it does have power. Um, power to, to create, a beautiful life and beautiful things in this world and also power to destroy us if our ego comes into play and we get hooked by desire because we're taking on the responsibility that is really it belongs to someone else it's another person's responsibility to um, handle their own issues and to uh, learn and grow themselves right and again that's why we're full. That's why these people know this. They play on our empathy. They want to believe that they're getting better, but they really never do. And they always need, you know, our help. 
So I just, I want to leave you with this. I hope that you never question how much your love and your good heart is worth again. You don't have to prove anything. If you get fooled into thinking that you do, then you may be compromising your boundaries of safety, okay? Mental or physical, or mental and physical. You know, it could be both. Users and abusers will try and provoke your empathy with many tactics, many, many. You'll spend countless hours spinning your wheels if you aren't careful, at the minimum, at the minimum. That's not even talking about the danger, right? <clears throat> you know, being sent on countless um, missions for nothing, right? That's what I mean when I say spinning your wheels. It's just all about keeping you stuck. And, and the last thing is, you don't have to go deep underground, right, in the darkness, going down to their level, right, um, to try and see things from their level because you just have this such a strong desire to empathize with them. Don't, don't feel like you have to do this because remember, when you do that, it's, you're in a danger zone at that point, all right? Your empathy and your love are priceless. They're pearls. So I just hope that this encourages you to, to view everything from, um, <clears throat> from different perspectives, to apply different lenses, and to understand the value that you have inside of you. So I hope that you are encouraged to protect it as well. So thank you for listening to the message today. I hope that you have a beautiful day, and I will see you again very soon.